Hello, just going to go ahead and, and discuss experiment number 11, the last experiment of the semester, and go through that process. This experiment uh, write-up is due next Monday, and uh, just so it's for, uh, you're clear, Monday will be our final exam. The final exam will start at 3 o'clock, and you'll have until 7 o'clock to finish. There will be 20 questions. It'll be mid uh, midterm, actually number uh, number two, over experiment seven, three, nine, and this experiment number eleven. There'll be twenty questions, multiple choice. You'll have to calculate, so you'll need your uh, basically uh, scratch paper and your calculator to do those uh, problems. Uh, this lab is on the science of spectroscopy. And so the science of spectroscopy is how we use light. And we, instead of just looking at something with light, we're using it in a way of kind of like how uh, a miner uses ore. You know, or they go through and they dig out a mine. They have all this ore. And within that ore might be little nuggets of information of richness called gold or silver or maybe diamonds and they enrich their themselves by finding those those pieces of uh, that are valuable and in some sense we do the same thing what we do is we take light that is really typically a mixture of many different colors which we means what that means is light of many different wavelengths spread it out and from that we could determine information about what we're looking for. And so the science of spectroscopy. Again, the way you say this is spectroscopy. And so anytime you've seen something like, you know, a little rainbow that you might see from the sunlight passing through a little crystal hanging from something and you'll see a rainbow of colors on a seat cover or on a sulfur or a curtain. That is the essence of what we're doing. We're spreading light out by a use of some device in order to determine, uh, you know, basically uh, what makes up the color of something. All the pure single colors that make up something. And so the crystal is that essence that we use. And in this lab, we use what is known as a diffraction grating. A diffraction grating. And this behaves very similar to what that crystal does, spreading light into its constituent colors. So uh, a diffraction grating is a piece of glass or plastic, and there's fine lines that are scored into the surface. And generally, there could be between 300 to maybe uh, 800 or so lines scored into a millimeter. A millimeter is about the width of my, between my two fingers. That's about a millimeter. So you have about six or 700 of those lines scored into that glass or plastic for every one of those millimeters. And of course, that means it takes some type of mechanical device to do that, uh, or some optical or, or uh, photographic method to find those lines. And so though each one of those are lines. And so we uh, have for every one of these, we know exactly uh, uh, how many lines are scored within this per millimeter. That's something given within diffraction grading. So if light from some source, so here's a light source, produce, is producing colors, and it passes here, what happens is what comes out on the other side, not only show a few colors, you'll get on one side of going straight through uh, a red, and then you'll get a nice, maybe a, a green, and you'll get maybe a violet or blue color. And of course, all the other colors might be present there depending on the type of, of uh, 
you know, source of light that you're, you're, you're working with. And one thing that happens, and it's just a, a, a feature of these diffraction gratings, if I look straight through, this is on one side, so if I'm looking straight through where the light source is hitting that, one side you'll see that pattern of colors. Turns out you get a, another mirror image of that on the other side of straight through. So over here you'll see the red, you'll see the nice green, and you'll see the blue or violet, and of course any other colors that you might find within that light source too. So you'll see, you know, basically patterns. And so what I mean by that, just to be clear, if this is the top view of the diffraction grating right here, and this is the light source right here, and this is straight through right there, that's straight through, then again what I'm saying is you'll see these patterns of color on either side. So you'll see violet, violet. You'll see the, the green and green and the red and red on either side of this. And what's kind of amazing is those are called the primaries. If you keep looking over, you'll see a duplication of the colors even beyond that. So you'll see the same colors reproduce themselves further out. Those are called the secondaries, and we never use those. You only use basically these primary ones right there. Don't use the secondary ones. And since we're having to, to, to effectively run this experiment with us not being in the class, and we're basically running this for you uh, and giving you the data, then uh, you, don't, you don't run any risk of using the wrong ones because we'll take care of that. So you'll get lines of color coming out of a source, and sometimes you'll get all the colors coming out of a source. The lines of color are called spectral lines, just terminology. Spectral lines of color. And so we'll talk about the types of spectra you might get as we go along with this. So the idea of this is uh, in the science of spectroscopy that there is methodologies that we'll use in, uh, in this to actually calculate and measure the wavelengths of colored spectral lines. And we'll explain why that's important later on. So, uh, if I look at the book on uh, page 131 of your uh, lab textbook, read that uh, the paragraphs above that and then answer the question there on page 131. And then, of course, on one page 132, 133 is where we uh, are basically walking through uh, definitions of terminology used in the lab. Uh, A, I want you to look this up in your textbook or online, the definition of the electromagnetic wave. So you find that yourself. Uh, we know that all light... And every radiation similar to light is an electromagnetic wave and part of the electromagnetic spectrum of radiation. Now, just to be very clear about this, because I want to make certain that you understand this, kind of going through the terminology of this, for every wave, and this includes light waves also, there are certain properties that we measure. Now in the laboratory class we may have talked about this, but we've certainly talked about it in the lecture class. And I know that some of you are not in my class this semester either with someone else this semester or you've had me in the past and not now. So I'm going to remind you. So what do we measure? Some of the properties. One is the size of one wave. So going from one point to a similar point, that distance right there is known as the wavelength of this wave. It's the length going from one peak to another peak, as an example, or from 
one trough to one trough. The symbol of wavelength means the word wavelength is the term, the Greek letter lambda, lambda. That's an A at the, at the back there. L A M B D A. A little hard to read there. So that's one wave. Now, a, a general way that we w typically look at a wave is we do this. We go start at a point, let's say right there in the middle. We go up, we go down, and then we go back up again. We go back to the same spot. That distance is one wave also. Each one of those is the same amount because it's one type of wave. So wavelength is the size of the wave. That's measured in terms of some units of meters. In this lab, what we do is we measure in terms of nanometers. A nanometer, one nanometer equals one times 10 to the minus nine meters. That's a nanometer. Because wavelengths of light are so small, a meter is way too big of a unit to use for this. So we use this. And light roughly runs between 400 nanometers up to about uh, 700 or so nanometers. 400, 700, 750, something along those lines. So uh, <clears throat> that's the units. That we use. Another thing is that we measure is wave speed. How fast are those wave waves moving? And for this is the speed of light, which is three times ten to the eight meters per second. So if a meter is about this big, it moves three hundred million of those in one second. It's extremely fast. Wave speed, C is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Another thing that we can measure is frequency. And so with frequency, that's the number of waves that pass per second. Number of waves that pass per second. So as an example with this, if I look and I say, oh, there's two waves that pass every second, then the frequency would be two waves per second. The way we say that is two hertz. So a hertz is the unit of one over second. You may have heard of hertz before named after a great scientist that was a part of these measurements. I'm going to go ahead and, and close these blinds. It might make it easier to see. I see that reflection of the sunlight on that screen that might make it difficult to actually see. Hope that helps a little bit. Another example of this is, say you've got one wave that passes every two seconds. Then the frequency here is one wave per two seconds, or one half hertz. Now there's a relationship between those three things. The wave speed equals the wavelength times the frequency. And so that's something you might need to know. So as an example, if I have a wavelength of 5 meters, a frequency of 2 hertz, then the wave speed would be 5 meters times 2 hertz, which is 10 meters per second, since hertz is 1 over second. So that's an example of this. So. What do we have then? Well, we have our three properties. There's one last property, and that is 
a height from the middle of the wave to the to the crest, or from the middle of the wave to the uh, to the trough, and they should be the same. And those lengths are known as the amplitude of the wave, and that's related to the brightness of the light in this case. How bright the light is, it, uh, a light is, depends upon its amplitude. So we have these properties. We have wave speed. We have, which is C for light. We have amplitude. We have frequency. We have wavelength. Four properties, V, A, F, and lambda. So uh, that's the wavelength relationship number five on page 132. And so that will help you with answering all the things you might need on page 132, 133. I'm going to go ahead and erase this. I want to make sure you have a chance to see it. I'm going to go ahead and erase this for this lab on Lebanon spectroscopy. And continuing on, uh, percent error and percent difference. We've talked about this before, so we re review this from previous labs. I'll just say this very quickly. Percent error is where you compare a measured value to a true value, an actual value that we know, and we'll use that in this lab, because you're going to compare a measured value of wavelengths for a spectral line of color to its true wavelength. So that's percent error. You've done the percent difference. That's where you take two measured values and compare one to the other. Spectral lines are those lines of color and sometimes they're lines of no color, called absorption lines, which we'll talk about soon. And they're lines because we've scribed lines into the diffraction grating. So it comes up with lines of color. The gas discharge tube is just a tube that we use in the experiment. And I will provide a, vi a couple of videos showing how we perform this experiment in the laboratory that I took. And I'll show you there what a gas discharge tube is. It's a small tube. It's kind of like what you would think of as a neon tube, uh, like a neon light. It's just a, a tube of glass with a low pressure gas in there of a particular type. Neon to, uh, lights have neon gases in that. In this particular case, what we have uh, is either hydrogen gas or helium gas. And we're going to look at those two different types of gas discharge tubes. And what we do is we place that gas tube into a fixture. And so if we have a fixture here, just a, right here, there's a place right here and a place right here that a tube, let me draw it a little bit better. fits into. And so this is the gas discharge tube right here, filled with the gas. It's put into a fixture, and that fixture provides basically uh, uh, five thousand volts to heat up that gas to make it glow. And that uh, then, in conjunction with your diffraction grating, becomes what's known as a spectrometer and some rulers. We use our two rulers. which I'll show you this in a second, spectrometer. And what a spectrometer does is allows is a, a tool to allow us to measure uh, the wavelengths of particular colors of light. That's what a spectrometer is. I'll say it again. A spectrometer is a tool that allows us to measure the wavelengths of individual spectral lines where each spectral line has its own particular color. I've shown you three or four in the past. One was a red, an orange, 
a green, and then a violet. So we had four spectral lines that I was indicating with my drawings when I discussed the diffraction gradient a moment ago. On page 134, you'll see a picture of a diffraction gradient that we actually use in our laboratory. It looks like a photographic slide, but it's actually just instead of a picture or a negative in there, what you have is an actual picture, uh, a piece of plastic with a line scribed into it for diffraction gradient. So, what we have then on page 134 is discussion of Kirchhoff's laws. So let me discuss this. I may go ahead and make several videos so you can have a break. And so I'll finish up with kind of the theoretical part of this and then discuss with you definitively with a second video, a final video on this of how to make your measurements from that, how to calculate your wavelengths, and from that then, uh, from your experimental wavelength and measured wavelength, how to do your uh, percent error and where you do this in the book. Okay, so what I have here then is Kirchhoff's Laws. And I'll go ahead and end the video after Kirchhoff's Laws. And so you may have seen this already in the uh, lab, in the lecture uh, uh, videos, when we talked about light, but I'll do it in here. Kirchhoff's Laws. Kirchhoff was a special scientist over in England. His name was not really Kirchhoff. It was a kind of a more ornamental name for him. doesn't matter. The main thing is he looked at, the, uh, uh, at light and discovered three effectively different types of spectrum. And that's the rainbow of colors. And so if you look, it's hard, uh, since the book is black and white, because I wanted to keep it as cheap as possible, on the top of page 134, this is really what it is. Let's say that you have a very hot, dense object. It glows with color, and we put a diffraction grating in front of it. What you get from this, then, coming out of this is a rainbow of every color. And so you'd have every shade of, of uh, violet, blue, have every shade of, of you know, green and yellow, every shade of orange and red. And this type of spectrum from a hot, dense object is known as a continuous spectrum, meaning every color is present. And a good example of this is a uh, normal uh, incandescent light bulb, the old type of light bulbs we used to have. So incandescent light bulbs an example of this. What an incandescent light bulb had was inside was a filament that got very, very hot. And that filament was maybe tungsten or some other very hard, dense metal that when it got hard, it would produce every color of the rainbow. And so you produce this nice, bright, white light. And it's very comfortable to the eye because our eyes are much more adapted to a spectrum that has most of the colors present. And so that's why the incandescent light bulb, the old-fashioned light bulb, was so popular. You know, it was restful to the eyes compared to, let's say, fluorescent light bulbs, which produce a lot more bluish light. And the same thing true for a screen of a, of a computer or a, you know, a phone or an iPad, which has a lot more blue lights, which is frankly kind of harmful. I don't know if you can see sometimes in this reflection of my glasses, you'll see a lot of blue light. And the reason why is my glass has a filtering agent that reflects a lot of blue light, so I don't see it. 
you know, if you're looking at screens a lot, guys, it's not healthy for your eyes. On the cones and rods of your eyes, that allows you to see things accurately. Blue light coming from iPads or, or uh, computer screens can actually tint and, and kind of fade those and makes it so that when you get older, you won't see as well. And so to protect from that, uh, that now, uh, glasses, uh, you should request in your, if, you're, if you wear glasses, you should request a filtering agent to get rid of that blue light, which is what I have. You can see it, a lot of bluish in there. So that's the first type. Hard, hot, dense objects produces every color of the rainbow. The other one is like what we find today in this gas discharge tube. If we have a low pressure hot gas, so this is a low pressure, like in found in a neon light to, uh, tubing or in a uh, the gas discharge tubes with us today with either hydrogen or helium gas, low pressure hot gas. And so let's say it's hydrogen. And we place our diffraction grating in front. What comes out of that is not every color of the rainbow. What we see are patterns of violet, you know, green. Really, we call it aquamarine. And I really wish you could see this in real life because it's the purest color found in nature. Individual colors. You'll see these bright colored lines of, uh, coming out of the diffraction grating, say from hydrogen. With helium, we'll see other shades of violet, green, and red, but also a nice orange color. And when you look at the videos I took, you'll be able to see the mist, mixed colors. For hydrogen, it looks really kind of reddish purplish. And if you look in your book at the emission nebulae, that are nice purpley color, uh, that's what because of hydrogen. With helium, because of that, uh, different shades of red, green, violet, and orange, it produces a nice salmon color, much different, m mingled together color. These lines are what's known as emission lines. So these are bright emission lines. And so this is known as an emission or bright line spectrum, an emission spectrum. And that's the type of spectrum will work today. So you can answer some of the question, the question on top of page 135. And one last thing. And this is uh, back to why doing the spectroscopy is so important. The colored emission lines produced by hydrogen, is not, none of those lines are duplicated by any other type of element or atom. In other words, if I measure for the, a uh, wavelength for the line that is violet, and it turns out to be the wavelength of hydrogen, violet spectral line, then I know that that must only be hydrogen because no other gas would produce the wavelengths, uh, wavelengths uh, of the violet or the aquamarine or the red that hydrogen produces. So they're like fingerprints. So let's take, say I look at a star and I find spectral lines and I measure their wavelengths and it turns out their wavelengths are the wavelengths of the spectral line found for hydrogen. I know hydrogen is in that star. See, who gets to go to stars and measure their wavelengths? And measure not only that, but get really close and take a sample of the surface. And then take it back to the laboratory to sample it and to work with chemistry to figure out what a star is made from. You can't do that. So how do we find the composition of stars, or any other type of object in the heavens. We look at their spectra. And when we do that, when we find spectral lines for a particular type of gas, 
say hydrogen or helium or oxygen or carbon, we know that those elements are found within the star and we do chemical analysis. And so you can answer the questions on the, t on the top and middle of page 135 with what I just said. There's a third type of spectrum, and this is the type of spectrum you find with star every star. And so three, this is where you have a hot, dense object, just like we saw in number one, produces a continuous spectrum. But in front of that is a low pressure cool gas, though, now. Say it's hydrogen. This was hot, so it's glowing, like the gas discharge tube glow. This, though, is a low pressure gas, and then outside of that, I put my diffraction grating. What I see is every color of the rainbow except the colors that I would find in hydrogen. The violet, the green, and the red, they would be missing because that gas, because it's cool, would absorb the colors that it would normally emit if it was hot. And so this is known as the absorption spectrum. So I'll say it again. Every star has this type of spectrum. And so basically what I'm saying is that when you have a hot, dense object and a cooler gas overhead, and then we spread that light out into a spectrum, we will see every color present. So all colors except these missing absorbed colors. These are missing colors. And those lines are called absorption lines. Now, even though the color is missing, we can determine their wavelengths because we relate it to seeing where all the other colors are. So these other colors would be present. So all the shades of red and uh, red and orange would be present, and yellow. All the shades of green and blue and violet would be present, but there'd be some missing colors in there, and those missing colors are absorbed because there's regions above the hot, dense area that are cooler. So think about the sun. You've got a really hot, dense inner region, cooler region outside, and so some of the light is absorbed. And so every star produces that type. And by either looking at bright lines from a hot gas like we'll do uh, in this lab, or we look at the dark absorbed lines, we can still find each one of those lines, whether it's emission or absorption, we can find their wavelength. And by knowing their wavelengths, we can compare it to the known wavelengths of all the elements when they're hot and in producing light, or if they're absorbing light, if they're cool, and determine if that star is made from that. So I hope this is clear. So this is the first video. I'll produce a second video right now to explain how you take this data and then fake data will be provided to you by videos that I will produce and give to you. Uh, they, uh, I'm waiting for them. Uh, actually, we filmed this. They're going to be sent to me today and I'll put this on uh, the Canvas website under Experiment 11 with these two videos. As, and I'll open it up as soon as I have that, that there. Talk with you soon on video number two for experiment 11. See you a little bit.